Good evening and welcome. I'm Adele Gautier from Breast Cancer Foundation New Zealand, and tonight we're talking about vitamin C and cancer. Before we get started, some housekeeping. If you have any technical issues, you can type the details of your problem in the chat box at the bottom left of your screen, and our support team will get in touch. Or you can call the number you'll see there and enter the passcode to get help. If you have any sound problems, you might want to listen on your phone while watching on your computer. You can see some instructions for how to do that at the bottom of your screen. You can use the chat box during the webinar to ask questions, which we'll get to later. You can also chat to other people there. Don't worry about missing out on information while you're chatting. The webinar is recorded and will be on our website in the next few days. So tonight we're talking about vitamin C and cancer. We've had lots of interest in this webinar. And if you're in Auckland, you might have seen a story in today's newspaper where oncologist Chris Jackson acknowledged the need for further research in the area. Some studies have shown that vitamin C is potentially helpful, and others have shown it can be harmful. How reliable are these studies, and what, if anything, does it mean for you if you have cancer? Well, I have to warn you, you won't get a definitive answer here tonight, but our three panelists will give you plenty to think about. <coughs> We're going to hear from Christine Mannins, from vitamin C researcher Professor Marguerite Visses, and from medical oncologist Dr. Richard Isaacs. Okay, so now first we'll hear from Christine. Christine has advanced breast cancer and is a long time vitamin C user. Christine, this is the second time you've appeared in one of our webinar panels, so welcome back. Uh, tell us about you and vitamin C. Well, first I'd like to apologise because I'll probably be reading a little bit more than I would like to be reading. Um, no, no excuses, just an apology. Well, in 2006, I was told I had a recurrence of my breast cancer with lesions in my liver. I'd been following my oncologist's suggestions, along with the usual lifestyle changes of eating more organically, if I could. Um, I stopped taking any dairy um, product, and I stopped drinking alcohol. But I obviously needed to do more or to do something different as I was now terminally ill. I had two primary school children and two teenage stepchildren at the time and I was desperate to live as long as I could. My dream, and it was a big dream, was to see my youngest son finish high school. So I looked for new ideas and therapies that made sense to me. One of them was IV vitamin C. I found others and found, in fact, I found an overwhelming amount of suggestions, clinics, trials, philosophies, well-meaning people with ideas and even answers. But I couldn't afford all the time or the money or, or the energy, actually, to take on board everything. I had to limit it to what I could sustain and what I felt was right for me. So I got in I got in touch with the Centre of Advanced Medicine and asked if they could tell me more about it and if they could give it to me. They could and they did. They were so upbeat and positive, two characteristics I desperately craved and needed after the finality and negativity and harsh delivery of my situation. And that has been one of the hardest most draining things I've had to face and cope with is that um, harsh reality. So I made a plan for living. And I, I nailed it down to three things. Doing what my oncologist advised, as long as he informed me clearly, and he usually did. And I felt comfortable with the treatment involved. Two, I decided to go to acupuncture twice a week. And three, I was going to do IV vitamin C twice a week. IV vitamin C cost around $185 a time. So that's $360 a week, a major investment. I was very lucky that my husband said, your job is to keep breathing. My job is to sort out how to fund it. And as some of us know, Funding up-to-date cancer treatment and new cancer treatment in New Zealand is an overwhelming and difficult job. Once I made my plan, and Alicia, my lovely husband, agreed to it, 
the next big thing I had to do was stick to it. Easier said than done, as it's easy to find excuses to miss one session or a week. Anyway, that's what I did until I needed to go back on chemotherapy and my oncologist told me that vitamin C was incompatible with my chemo treatment. I had IV vitamin C twice a week for 12 years. Occasionally I'd go on holiday and have a small break, but I pretty much followed that schedule for that length of time and would have continued if I could. It was hard. My veins suffered greatly from such a prolonged workout. It meant at least four hours a week, at least four hours a week, was spent lying in my doctor's room waiting for my drip to finish. And sometimes it would give me a terrible headache because I'd become dehydrated and it would even make me vomit, especially if I sped up my drip while the nurses weren't looking. <laughs> the upside well, I got to know my GP and the nurses really, really well. And without their relentless and compassionate support and positivity, it would have at times been unbearable. Do I think it was worthwhile? Well, there was little research when I first started IV vitamin C, so it was a risk. And I can only talk anecdotally, but this is my experience and my belief. I believe IV vitamin C allowed my body to make the best use of any hormonal or biological treatment I was also taking at the time. It extended their success and made my body a hostile place for cancer to flourish and for new tumours to develop. Now there's research that supports premise that high CSP Cuticle doses of vitamin C kills cancer cells. I'm not surprised. It also, I felt, supported my immune system. And as far as I'm aware, it didn't damage my body. The proof for me is the fact that after nearly 14 years of metastatic breast cancer, that's of cancer that has been present and curable within me, I am still breathing and still grateful for the opportunity I have to follow that life plan and to live my life with purpose. My youngest son has long since left school, left uni, left home. I think I'm very lucky. Not exceptionally lucky, but pretty lucky. Thank you. Well, Christine, thank you so much for sharing that with us, your very personal journey with vitamin C. Um, we're going to hear now from Professor Marguerite Visses. Marguerite's a senior research scientist in the Centre for Free Radical Research at the University of Otago in Christchurch. She leads a team investigating vitamin C and its many functions in our bodies. And her res research into oxidant stress has extended our understanding of the role of food-based antioxidants for good health and disease prevention. Her work in vitamin C has earned an international reputation. Margaret, thank you so much for coming tonight when we know you're super busy with um, a vitamin C symposium coming up in Auckland over the next few days. Tell us where vitamin C research is at in cancer. What exactly do we know? Um, okay, thanks Adele and thanks for the invitation and thank you Christine. I um, always feel quite inadequate um, talking about science following somebody's personal experience um, like that. So I'll do my best here. Um, I became interested in, in vitamin C in cancer, um, having followed the very early studies with some scepticism. When we uncovered a new role for vitamin C um, in probably around 2003, um, and so we realized that vitamin C was doing things that we didn't know um, that it, that it could do, and I realised that one of those things would have an impact um, on cancer. So I'm going to just progress through with my slides. I'm going to talk about this um, with respect to breast cancer, um, because that's the audience that, that we're talking to. Um, so many of you or what have been told, like most people are, that get the best, you know, you get the best chances with breast cancer if you um, 
exercise and eat well. So that all of these things that you do yourself to keep yourself well and healthy um, are shown to have um, a beneficial effect on outcome. Most of the evidence from that is from epidemiological studies. And one of the things that impacts on that, we believe, from diet is um, vitamin C. So I think in my next slide, can we advance two slides and then Sorry. come back one? Can we go to the next one? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the, so this slide, if you if you can read it, and I'll just talk people through it quickly. Um, this is a summary of of all of the epidemiological studies that have been done, looking at at dietary mod modulation of vitamin C post diagnosis in breast cancer. And if the dots and the bars that you see are to the left of that line down the middle, then that then that means that there's a benefit in those studies. And so overall, the, co the um, conclusion has been, or is now, that there is a slight advantage. So it's something like a 15% survival advantage if you boost your vitamin C dietary intake. I believe this is probably one component of the good dietary advice. Um, if we go back one slide now, sorry. Yeah. What I want to talk about with respect to vitamin C and where we think that that just dietary advice is probably not quite all of the story in cancer is that when we take vitamin C in through our food, it's limited, our plasma levels are limited to about 100 micromolar. Our bodies soak up the vitamin C from the plasma. And when, you're, when your plasma is saturated, that under normal conditions, that's as much as your organs will take up. They won't take up any more than that. OK, so I'm going to jump forward too. Um, and so we're going to go um, now to, to think about, you know, so if vitamin C is good for breast cancer, so we're thinking, how, how would it work? And to do that, I'm going to talk a little bit about cancer biology, and I hope you um, bear with me. So we have we have this picture here, and you'll see one of it looks like a kind of a plant. It's actually the blood vessels in a tumor, and you'll see that as they go towards this dark center, that there are fewer and fewer blood vessels. And we know that a growing tumor outgrows its blood supply. When it does that, that core of that tumor becomes hypoxic, and that that's a lack of oxygen. So the blood the blood vessels are not getting there. The oxygen can't get there. Those cells are under stress then. Tumor cells are also under stress because they're growing so quickly. Now, both of these things have an outcome in the, in the growing cancer cell. So, and and the, way that, the way those cells respond is by upregulating this very normal process that all our cell, cells have called the hypoxia-inducible factor. And when, this is where we became interested in vitamin C, because we know that vitamin C, well, we learned that vitamin C is, is, is involved in down-regulating this response. So it's an off switch for this mechanism. So what we know with this hypoxic response, or HIF1, is that all of the properties that we see in cancer cells, most of them, if not all of them, are due to the driver of HIF1 that is the response to the outgrowth and the rapid growth of those tumors. And so when that becomes upregulated, so it drives the sugar, the sugar hungriness or the glycolysis of, of cancer, it drives the growth of those cancer cells, treatment resistance, angiogenesis, so the formation of new blood vessels, and metastasis. All of these processes shown to be dependent on HIF1. So what does that mean for breast cancer? And I've put in um, here um, a graph of some of our, um, our most recent results. And other people have shown this also, that the more of this HIF activation you get in breast cancer, the, the worse your chances of survival. So Breast cancers that have high HIF expression 
have a very poor prognosis. And we're not the only people to have shown this. This is an established fact, if you like, um, now, close to a fact, um, as you can get in tumor biology. So we thought, with all of those things going on in the, in, in the cancer cell, is it possible that cancer cells are actually depleted in vitamin C? And if you could boost that vitamin C level, would that, would that actually dampen that response and slow the, the growth of the tumor? Um, I'd like to uh, reiterate that I think in breast cancer, we don't have any evidence for um, any cures um, from vitamin C. If this mechanism were to be um, involved, it would more likely be a slowing down of the cancer growth um, rather than a killing of the cancer if this were the mechanism. So we have um, measured vitamin C and TIF1 in, in um, a number of cancers, including breast cancer. And on the next slide, Adele, you'll see some of our um, data in which, so this is cancer tissues from the tissue bank in Christchurch. So these are tumors that have been removed by surgery. There's been no intervention here. But all the tumors that had high vitamin C activity had very low levels of this HIF1. And in fact, we show um, an, an, an advantage in survival um, for the breast cancer cohort um, with the high vitamin C from those patients. So, so far what we have is an association between the amount of vitamin C in a tumor and the activation of this aggressive promoting protein. And so we're optimistic that if somehow you could maybe modulate the effect of the amount of vitamin C delivery to the tumor, that it's possible you could downregulate um, that HIF1, which may impact, would certainly help with cancer treatment. We don't see this as a um, standalone thing, um, but in, in conjunction with other things, we think potentially it could be um, a really interesting tool. We don't have the proof for that yet. We're working towards that. Um, so just in terms of like, how would you advise people? How could you actually manage to do this? Well, the way you have to do it is you have to deliver vitamin C to that tumor. And you have to deliver or you have to mitigate against the HIF1 activity. And interestingly, both of the things that people are advised to do could both work in that way. So Improving your diet would almost undoubtedly improve your vitamin C intake. And exercise, interestingly, increases your circulation and is very likely to increase the oxygenation um, to the tumor and the delivery of things through your blood, through your circulation. So both of those things, which you could do, anyone can do, and is advised to do, would probably feed into this pathway as one way in which that might work. The other thing that, um, that I've, I wanted to point out and something that, that we know when people ask, so how much vitamin C should I take for that, there's a recommendation for daily intake for vitamin C that is based on what a healthy person needs. Now we know that if we measure vitamin C status of almost anyone who is sick, unless they're taking a supplement, then their vitamin C status is very likely to be lower than, than optimal. And so it's advisable, if you're not eating very, very well, that you can boost your vitamin C intake with a simple supplement. It doesn't have to be a mega dose supplement, but you probably need an intake of around 400 to 500 milligrams a day as opposed to the 200. Um, and so it is true, the sicker you are, the more depleted your vitamin C becomes because it's a great oxidant target. So it's a casualty of, of your being ill 
And so unless you top up that vitamin C level, then you're very likely to have the low par um, levels, which will impact not only on the cancer but on all your other um, well-being. Um, and so that's one of the questions. We still have a lot of questions. Um, so it's what is the impact of those low vitamin C levels um, on a growing tumour? What's the impact on patient quality of life? And what's the impact on outcome and future risk? Um, we're carrying on our research. We not, I don't think doctors are at a point where they're able to advise their patients. Certainly not able to recommend um, clinical interventions because we don't have we don't have enough knowledge to know exactly how to use um, vitamin C against cancer. But there's progress. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Marguerite. That was super interesting. And um, hopefully everyone kept up with <laughs> some of the technical, technical <laughs> terms there. Yes. That was um, really great. Um, and now we're going to hear from Dr. Richard Isaacs. He's a medical oncologist at Palmerston North Hospital. You may know him if you're a patient there. Or you might even remember his name from the days when Kiwi patients were fighting for access to 12 months of Herceptin and Richard was a, a vocal advocate for that. And a few years ago, in fact, he was made a member of the New Zealand Order of Merit for his service to oncology, acknowledging his leadership role in breast cancer care. But he's actually also a scientist. He has a PhD in molecular oncology from Oxford University in, in the UK, where he worked with renowned breast cancer researcher Professor Adrian Harris. Richard, I'm sure you've had Richard on the other screen on your on your um, screens there, folks, because he's actually in New Plymouth where he's been doing a patient clinic today, um, and he's come straight from work. So, Richard, thank you, and I'm sure you've had many patients who've taken vitamin C. What have you said to them, and what would you say to patients and members of the public who are watching us tonight? Thanks very much, Adele, and thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, first of all, I want to acknowledge Christine's story um, and really uh, salute her positive approach to her cancer care. I think that it highlights the difference that having a positive attitude makes, and it also unfortunately highlights some difficulties that uh, conventional clinicians have with communication sometimes and that we need to look forward positively and give hope rather than sometimes offer just the negative information. I'd also like to um, acknowledge the excellent work that Professor Visses and her team um, are undertaking down in Christchurch. I think it's fantastic that um, you're researching the actual biology of how vitamin C potentially works uh, with cancer. I do have some questions about whether your work will lead to an intervention. And it would be really interesting, for example, to see whether you can actually reverse the hypoxic state in a tumour with vitamin C rather than just increasing levels. And one has to wonder whether there's a contribution from the vascularity of the tumour. But I wanted to talk about things from um, a clinician's perspective. Once I get this moving. Let me know if you want me to move them. No, I've, I'm, in, I'm we're fine. So um, vitamin C is, is very important in a number of metabolic uh, processes in the body as listed above or listed on this, on this slide. Um, and it has been found to have an antioxidant uh, action, particularly in higher doses. The extraordinary thing when um, I started looking at this area was the number of uh, aspects of medicine where it was felt to have a role. I, I've been asked to confine myself to uh, cancer prevention and treatment, although I have to say discussion of its role in the other areas is interesting, if not always positive. Um, and that's not working, so I'll go back here. Why don't I just move that along? Uh, that's right. I'll be fine. Um, vitamin C was initially used or advocated to prevent cancer on, on the basis of those antioxidant activities and it might prevent DNA damage, the DNA damage which leads to cancer development. In terms of actual, actual treatment, which is one of what I want to focus on, um, there have been a number of potential mechanisms proposed. Some people have suggested that the antioxidant effects may actually have an effect on the cancer growth. At high doses, vitamin C can be turned into hydrogen peroxide and has the opposite effect, increasing free radical damage. Uh, to, to cells. 
I think that um, Marguerite's work on its role as a cofactor is one of the most interesting areas and needs to be explored. And there have been um, claims that it, it promotes immune integrity, as, as Christine was told. Why did I get interested? Well, we actually reviewed all the patients who come to our cancer centre in, in a quite a, a while ago. Um, we, we put questionnaires in the outpatient department and, and we got more than 50% reply, so it wasn't absolute, but of those people who replied, 49% um, used what is considered a complementary and alternative medicine and vitamin C sits there. It'll only sit there until it's proven to be effective. Of those uh, people who took an, a, a CAM, 80% used more than one type of therapy, uh, almost half used four or more, and 14% used at least seven. And the vast majority were using uh, vitamins and antioxidants, although there's a whole role uh, or, or list, as, as you can see up there, of other things that people, people did, the most expensive of which was transfer factor, um, which was uh, several hundred dollars and really hasn't been proven to have a role. Interestingly, um, people use it for a variety of reasons. Uh, what's happened there? Um, you will see that m many people use it for quality of life. Some use it, they thought, to prevent further cancer. But importantly, about a third used it in the hope that it was controlling or curing their cancer. And I think, Christine, you were using it to control your cancer. The important thing was that less than half told us that they were taking anything, and particularly younger patients tended to hide it from us. Um, I also became aware that intravenous vitamin C was being administered by general practitioners at significant cost, as outlined by Christine. So I had a look at what the clinical information was. In terms of uh, cancer prevention, there have been many studies performed, including a number of reviews and what we call meta-analyses. And, and when they weren't positive, there was really very little media attention. Uh, this is a little bit dense on this slide, but basically in 2008, there was a very large Cochrane review. Cochrane is a highly respected group of researchers who uh, go back to individual patient data looking at different studies. And they looked at 210,000 patients who are at risk of developing gastric or gastrointestinal cancer to see whether predominantly vitamin supplements affected the risk of cancer, and unfortunately it did not reduce the risk of, of GI cancers. As a suggestion, mainly linked to vitamin A and beta carotene, that it may in fact have worsened outcome. Similar results with lung cancer. A study of 77,000 uh, men and women, and it did not reduce the risk of lung cancer, these different vitamins, and vitamin E had a higher risk. Now in breast cancer, the, the different studies are conflicting. Um, I have to say that I, I I'm, have also looked at the Harris paper and I have some concerns about the methodology. They did not go back to individual patient level and only four of the ten studies looked at activity. There was no measure of fat in the diet. There has been a significant study from the States that showed that in a randomised trial where people were randomly allocated to have a normal diet or a low fat diet, there was an 11% reduction in relapse with a low fat diet, so knowing how much fat you use is important. And exercise is increasingly recognised as, a, as a, a factor which reduces relapse. Alcohol, particularly in postmenopausal women with a, a, a slightly increased body weight, anything more than two drinks a day increases the risk of relapse. In terms of cancer treatment, oh, it's this is, um, I mean, this, I just mentioned this briefly. Linus Pauling was one of the um, major advocates for, for um, vitamin C. We all know that vitamin C is, is a very effective treatment for vitamin C deficiency, and when that's severe, it's scurvy. Um, he um, introduced the concept of high dose vitamin C for influenza initially. Um, I won't go into that, but the actual results of the Cochrane review of that are also disappointing. But he also advocated its use as cancer treatment, and he looked at or reported 100 patients with advanced cancer who were given oral vitamin C, and their survival was compared to 100 similar patients from the hospital records, and there was a marked improvement for those given vitamin C by mouth. 
unfortunately, and his conclusions were that, that, that it was fantastic, it may improve survival from 5 to 20 years, for example. So that would obviously uh, produce a lot of excitement. But unfortunately, there was bias in the study. I think it's really important that we look at the way that trials are done. The average survival of the controls was only 50 days, but we know that the average survival of untreated bowel cancer is in the region of six months, so he'd chosen patients with a much worse outcome. So it needed repeating. Just quick, when we look at developing um, new treatments, and you'll be aware of all the um, discussion about new drugs going through Pharmac, well, what, what happens first is that science of the quality of Margrit's and others produces a potential weakness in a cancer that um, a drug or an agent may attack, or which may, it may modify. One then tests it in a trial of heavily pretreated patients to see if it is safe and if it has any activity. You then use it in a group of patients with a disease type to see what sort of response rate you get. And then you compare it to conventional treatment and, and ultimately continue to monitor its benefits. Well, vitamin C unfortunately had jumped straight to phase three. And it was a poorly designed trial. So what other trials have been done? Well, the two trials that were done in the States were randomized studies, quite small numbers, but they both looked at giving uh, vitamin C to patients with advanced cancer. Um, and no benefit in the initial one, but the concern was that those, those patients who had, had advanced disease and their immune systems might be weak. But in the second study, these were untreated bowel cancer patients and there was no benefit. So that led to um, a negative impact on the use of vitamin C for quite some time until people uh, started to identify that you could get much higher circulating levels of vitamin C by giving it intravenously. Um, and then that's been explored. And it does, uh, it's been shown that in mice it, it can shrink tumours, and so it may have benefits in mice. And I, I have absolute respect for the authors of this phase one study who went on to look at the use of IV vitamin C in advanced cancer. They found no harm in their patient group, but they also found no treatment effect. Uh, and so most drugs would not proceed beyond that point unless there was new science to enable them to be used in a different way. Simply using higher doses for a treatment that doesn't work does not make good sense. Uh, similarly, if you're using a drug to be a cofactor um, to modify biological processes, why would you need to give truckloads of the drug? It doesn't make sense to me. There has been concern about the use of antioxidants with oncology treatments. Again, the evidence is conflicting, but this is a big review from the Journal of the National Cancer Institute. And the overall advice is that while some studies suggest that there is no interaction, Certainly there is in other studies, um, and, and that's why cancer specialists have caution about using the drug or using vitamin C at the same time. This was a study produced by researchers from Dunedin and Wellington at the New Zealand Society of Oncology some years ago, showing that mice who were treated with vitamin C and radi radiation therapy did worse than those with radiotherapy alone, suggesting that vitamin C may protect the cells, the cancer cells, with its, uh, its antioxidant effect. Similarly, in cell line studies, uh, this was one study. I appreciate that there are others which haven't shown such effects, but this study of looking at cancer cells growing in the Petri dish showed that vitamin C protected against all different drugs. More recently, um, there was a review just last year um, really focusing on the use of intravenous vitamin C, looking at its safety, looking at um, how it seemed to improve quality of life for some cancer patients. And they referred to a number of studies uh, uh, indicating that there was a benefit from intravenous vitamin C in cancer treatment. And this is where you have to look at the quality of the trial. The trials they referred to were small, small numbers, make statistics different. Single arm means that there was no control arm. You really can't make any conclusions. Uh, you can't just compare it to another trial like Linus Pauling did by, by not having both groups in the same um, exposure. The two trials that were randomized were small. One actually wasn't a randomized trial. They, they included cell line or cells in the petri dish findings with side effects in humans. And the other one which is worthwhile exploring is looking in elderly patients where vitamin C does seem to be a cofactor 
and improve the efficacy of some of the drugs used in leukemia. But that study only had 35 patients in each arm, again making strong conclusions difficult. And I looked, but I couldn't find any of those more advanced studies to show clear benefit. Now people talk about it being safe, it isn't completely safe. If you take high dose um, vitamin C orally, particularly if you have kidney problems, you're at risk of getting kidney stones, further kidney damage, particularly if you have an enzyme deficiency. That's normally checked for by those people who are giving the drug, but there are some risks. In terms of IV, um, the data is still to be determined. Certainly there are some studies suggesting it can be safe, but this is another thing I'm afraid that, that made me uh, have concerns. We had a, a patient in my hospital who took large doses of oral vitamin C, went into kidney failure, he refused to have dialysis and died, and in his kidneys there were vitamin C aggregates or crystals, oxalate crystals. So uh, you have to have some caution, and I'm much more interested in Marguerite's approach of modifying the biology in a refined fashion than tipping a truckload of a drug into a person without knowing how it works and whether it will cause harm. So my conclusions are that as a single agent there is no good evidence yet of activity in humans, its toxicity is uncertain, and its use I haven't referred to, but some people will have vitamin C and other alternative therapies and delay effective systemic treatments, which can lead to worse outcomes. I, at this time, would recommend it be avoided in combination with chemotherapy or radiation treatment. And I just finish by recommending two sites if you want to get information about therapies that your oncologist may have concerns about because they're not conventional. The Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Centre has an, a lot of quite comprehensive information about CAMS and there's a great app that is free that you can put on your cell phones called About Herbs. So if you just Google that or look in the app store for About Herbs, that's also very helpful. So that's all I've got to say. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Richard, and thank you so much to all three of you. We've had some quite wide uh, ranging references to different studies, different experiences, and different views on vitamin C. We're now going to open up to some questions from you at home. Um, some of you have been typing questions in the box at the bottom left of your screen, and you can do that. We are having a little bit of difficulty technically with that box at the moment, but you can put your questions in there and they, they will get to me just a little bit slower than they might otherwise do so. Um, so we'll get through um, what we can in, in the rest of the time available. Um, so, um, okay, so a question here, um, right, okay, so a question about um, Reducing the risk of recurrence, um, an ideal, um, and, and the role of exercise and vitamin C in reducing the risk of breast cancer recurrence. Um, what's the sort of ideal exercise? Is there a view, Marguerite, on the level of exercise you need to do to maybe boost um, oxidation in the blood? Is that kind of thing? I, I think we'd have to hand that that. A question over to Richard. Um, <laughs> I'm not a clinician, um, so you know my understanding of what of you know is, is like a patient's understanding. Where if a doctor tells you to do more exercise, <laughs> 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 it means get on my bike. <laughs> um, so um, Richard may like to address that question. Uh, to be honest, I mean there's uh, two papers presented at the recent San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium which looked at quite intensive exercise with both gym work and regular walking um, and, and, and that was, they showed powerful reductions in, in the risk of recurrence. But I really think, I mean we've done a study in our centre looking at preventing weight gain in women who are having chemotherapy for breast cancer and um, if you can do that, you obviously you prevent the weight gain, you reduce circulating estrogen levels, and you may improve outcomes in that way. And we advocated women would go for brisk walks at least four times a week for more than half an hour to get their pulse up over 100. And I think that for most women would improve cardiovascular fitness, and it may uh, improve oxygenation to enable interventions that Marguerite was referring to to be more effective. Um, it also gives women control and a feeling of control as they're going through cancer treatment. Um, even if 
you feel tired, if you can do that, you will feel better. Right. Um, As we all would. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yes. Um, now, with um, regard to a lot of what we're talking about tonight, I've been talking about vitamin C during the treatment phase. What about after treatment? What about the lifestyle or the, the um, I guess, the advantages of taking vitamin C after treatment? So, do your treat, do, Margaret, do you, your vitamin C levels well, go up when you well, your vitamin C levels go up if your intake meets your your loss. So we can't make vitamin C. So if we were animals, we'd keep ourselves at optimal levels, but um, but we can't. And so we have to balance intake with turnover, and turnover varies depending on on the state of your health. So. A normal healthy person, 200 milligrams a day is what's recommended to keep you at saturation levels. Probably don't need even need 200. It's easy to get from your diet. Um, so taking additional um, vitamin C won't benefit that. So that's why we always recommend diet first. Um, it's when your turnover is accelerated either by by your being sick, or um, or by the treatment that you that you're going, which might consume it, that then you can um, restore your level by by boosting your intake. The infusions are interesting, and we're um, we believe that there are some advantages when people have infusions, but we're not sure. How much you know? Whether the amount that's infused is what's necessary, or but unfortunately, as Richard alluded to, all there, there's so much has been done without any thought for design and for who you're targeting. So vitamin C has been freely available, and people have used it willy-nilly and have con conducted trials without thinking. Um, about what you know, what who to target, what you know, it, it's and so it's a bit of a mess, um, and we're fortunate that it's by and large um, safe. But but we need, which is why we're looking at mechanisms, and other people are too, because once we once we have an idea of mechanism, then then we can think about well, in order to achieve that outcome, this would be a good regime. And so we're moving towards that, and hopefully it will become more sensible, and we'll be able to tell people um, a little more accurately. Mm. Um, I would say that once someone has had their tumor removed surgically, that there's probably you can keep your body at optimal levels of vitamin C with oral intake, but, um, and and hopefully you can do that. Right. Can I make a comment, please? Oh. Adele? Yep, yep, go for it. Uh, just one of the things about that latest meta-analysis. I, I think I mentioned the confounding factors of other lifestyle factors. I, I would strongly suspect that those women who are motivated to take vitamin C also are motivated to have a healthy diet, to exercise, and have optimal body weight. And it is extremely difficult to sort out what the contribution of each of those is to any better outcome. So that's just an extra little dose of cynicism. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. That's um, that that's um, that's it's almost it's impossible. It's almost impossible from from epidemiological studies of dietary intake to tease one factor out from another. Mm. And and so this is based on mechanism. We're proposing that there is that that this is one of the ways in which that might work. Which is why your work is very important. Um, there's some comment around um, the fact that it can be very hard to muster up the energy to exercise and so on during cancer treatment. Um, is there evidence that we hear anecdotally that people say vitamin C gives them energy? Is there any evidence around improved energy levels? Do you know, Marguerite? Um, yes, there is. Um, um, it, and this is one of the quality of life support. So what we know now is that 
vitamin C has a multitude of roles to play in the body, and one of the things that it does boost is energy and vigor. Um, and that is, we think, um, through the production of carnitine, which is um, an energy producing, more helps your, helps your body metabolize fat. Um, and so that uh, there are a number of activities that are associated with a boost in energy. And so people say that, and I listen with interest when they tell us that. Can I make a comment? Sure. <laughs> I'm sorry to keep poking the nose in. Okay, uh, I think one of the things about taking a tablet, um, if you really believe it's going to work, it often does make you feel better. And I just want to tell you the story of managing hot flushes and perimenopausal symptoms in women who have had breast cancer treatment. And I'm sure that many of those women listening have, have suffered profoundly from that. They've been um, many different treatments which have been proposed, um, including things like evening primrose, black cohosh, as well as um, more recently some medications such as antidepressants and, and the, a, a drug called oxybutynin, which is used for stress incontinence. And many of those um, early studies and those studies used with uh, CAM-type treatments show benefits of about 40%. So 40% will get improvement. That's a placebo effect. That's an effect of the mind on the body because when you do controlled trials, um, even if you give a dummy tablet, 40% of people improve. When you give medications that actually interfere with the pathways, such as with oxybutynin, another 30% improve. But with those other agents, they don't go beyond 40%. So our body and our mind is a very powerful tool uh, in terms of, of treating or improving the symptoms that we suffer as we go through treatment and beyond. And a question about um, how easily can you test your vitamin C level? I guess not very easily. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> so, no, there aren't. Um, it's not a standard laboratory test. You can request it from your doctor, but. Um, it's quite a tricky thing to measure. Once you take a blood sample from the body, the vitamin C starts to oxidize. And so unless you have somebody on hand to handle the blood, put it in ice, take it to the lab and process it, then um, the, the answer you get is probably not the correct answer. And so it's quite tricky for hospitals to manage that. So it's not routinely measured. Um, there are no finger prick tests or anything that um, we're aware of yet, hopefully one day maybe. Um, but it, it, is, it is quite hard to measure and um, for, from that point of view and to get a result that, that's the correct result. So, so many, not many doctors um, will measure vitamin C status. Right, that's interesting. And what is the, what kind of dosage do people get in an IV? What level, you know, how many grams, milligrams are, they, are people getting in a, in a vitamin C dose? Christine, oh, I know it's based on weight, oh, okay. like, like chemotherapy. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah. So there is a therapeutic level that can be tested. Yeah. Yeah. So people are often given up to 75 grams intravenously. Yeah, so by, um, Linus Pauling, and interestingly, gave in his IV infusions, gave 10 grams. Um, a day for like six weeks or something, and then move to, to oral supplementation. Um, because people have had no side effects, people have just kind of increased that dose as we've gone along. And so, what it's limited more by the sodium load that comes with it, um, which is why you will experience that dehydration and headaches and. Um, because the, uh, if, you hit, if your kidneys are fine, it will just flush out. And so, so it's most likely that the doses that are given are way in excess of where they need to be. Um, and it's been done just because people keep, have kept just giving more and more um, because they can, um, which is it hasn't been guided by any kind of knowledge base, unfortunately. 
And is there a different practice in the way GPs and so on give vitamin C? And are there things that patients should be cautious about? Well, I, well, I think Richard. I think the Jolly GPs should give them some accurate clinical advice rather than charging them all that money. I find it unethical for a doctor to give treatment without evidence of benefit. Okay, and Marguerite, have you got any? Um, well, I would love, you know, I would love there to be decent studies, and I think, um, and as Richard said, we need good clinical trials, um, and for that. We need to design them well, and so you know we think there may be something going on here. And in order to test that, we need to be doing well-informed clinical trials, which haven't been done yet, and it really hasn't helped the discussion that a lot of the clinical trials have been done badly. And so you know this is a this is a terrible area to do research in because. Um, People are at each other's throats. <laughs> you, know, you know, there's a there's an argument going on that that is not rational, and um, and so it's hard to get a dispassionate view on on what's the evidence, what kind of things do we need to do, what could be real and what's not real, and so you know we're so Marguerite, if you could possibly do some animal studies and show an improvement in the um, hypoxic state with vitamin C administration, we, you would have, have doctors very interested in doing we, that. We, we have already done that. We've, we've, we've already done that and we've already published that. So we have um, we've done studies in our, in our gulo mouse. We have a, a, a skin cancer model and a lung cancer model in, in those mice. And so far, our theory is still standing up, or our hypothesis is still standing, that when we, when we increase the vitamin C into those mice, it slows down the tumor growth. It doesn't, rem it doesn't stop the tumor growth, but it slows it down. And the HIF1 is knocked down, and the ascorbate goes up in the tumor. And that's with, interestingly, we have to achieve a level in those tumors to get that effect, and we and we can achieve that level with high dose if the tumor is already established in high dose vitamin C into those mice daily will give us the, that a level high enough in the tumor to knock that activity down. Um, we probably need to talk about it separately because it's getting a bit yeah. tech, right, but, that um, a bit technical. Uh, I mean, it'd be interesting to see if you could knock out HIF selectively in another way. Okay, so I think we'll just get yeah. back from, the, from that um, technical discussion there. Um, Richard, a patient here said that her um, doctor isn't interested in talking about the supplements that she's interested in, her oncologist. Um, what, what's the key to actually having a productive conversation between a patient and an oncologist about this? Yeah, I mean, clearly, I think there needs to be a positive approach um, to invite discussion and to try and prevent present what information the doctor is aware of and it probably it does behove us to be aware of new developments and to be able to discuss things sensibly and I think also to refer people uh, to those websites and apps that I talked about. Um, there's obviously a, a, a reluctance to discuss things because patients feel they may be judged. Um, and, and they may be right, <laughs> they may be judged I guess. Absolutely. I mean, what can I do? We try and change that. We invite people to do that in our centre. I don't know how to change it in other centres other than to you know, um, um, emphasise the importance of good communication, and that goes back to what Christine was talking about at the start. Mm -hmm. Great. And um, in terms of, um, someone else has asked here, Marguerite, about lipospheric vitamin C. What is that? It seems to be the buzz. My chemist is always selling little packets of it. What is it? Yes, well, I, so I'm going to really diss these people now, but but um, I, I see that in the chemist too for three dollars a sachet, yeah. and um, or around or around about that. And some people will swear by it, but 
your body can't tell one sort of vitamin C from, from another. And vitamin C, as I said, is very water soluble. We don't need to put it in a delivery package. Um, so the vitamin C in your food will be the same as the vitamin C in your tablet, which is the same as the vitamin C in the lipospheric sachets. Um, and your body will absorb everything from a tablet and everything from the food. Um, so I don't know if you want to supplement something from the supermarket, probably just as good. <laughs> right. Interesting. Um, Richard, could you remind us of the name of the app that you mentioned? About Herbs. About Herbs. We have a couple of people asking that. That's the About Herbs app. Um, here's a question. Does vitamin C help with wound healing after breast surgery or after any surgery? I guess. Anyone got a view on that? Yes. <laughs> yes and yes. <laughs> well, yes, and once again it's dependent on your body having that optimal, being at, being at that optimal level. Um, one of the first signs of low vitamin C is poor wound healing. And so, you know, one of the things you can do to help recover from surgery is just to either eat really well, make sure that you that you've got enough vitamin C intake to um, to help with that because you know, one of the things we know is that you need it for collagen synthesis, there's all lots of, lots of other activities in the skin and in the tissues that um, depend on vitamin C. So wound healing is a well known um, benefit. Good wound healing. Can, I, can I ask Margaret a question? Um, sure. Do you think vitamin C is best taken as part of a natural diet or as a synthetic chemical? I think it's always best taken as part of the natural diet. Yeah. Um, and it, and, if someone's and deficient, how much always, would they? We always recommend food first. Yeah. Um, and the reason for that is that the foods that have vitamin C in them not only have that in them, they have other things in them that are good for you. Mm. Um, so you get all the additional benefits as well. And why would you? We don't advocate single new, single item nutrition. Um, so well, I agree with you 100%. I mean, I think the the more good quality foods with, um, you know, five plus fruit and veg is a very good diet for yeah, a whole range of different conditions. We do have to wrap up. Yeah. Um, Richard, I think you were going to ask if you are deficient in vitamin C, what level of supplement is that right? Or did I imagine that? Um. Well, that's what some other people have asked, anyway. Um, well, if, well, if you are deficient, right. then you need to take in more than you're currently taking. Um. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it's not a lot to do research on that. And, <laughs> and, and it's not a lot, and, it, and how much you need depends on, on the state of your health. But it's not, it's not a lot that you need to keep your body at, at, um, at optimal level. So, um, yeah. Okay, um, we're just about out of time, so we will wrap up now. Thank you so much to Christine, Margaret, Margaret and Richard for joining us tonight. You've all been absolutely fantastic. Uh, we hope you at home found this helpful, and we'd appreciate if you could take a second or two to fill out the um, questionnaire, the feedback as you exit the webinar. If you do want to know more about vitamin C, there is a public session at the um, Symposium at AUT on Saturday. That mm -hmm. you can still come to that. Yep. It is. You have to pay. You yeah. do have to pay. Yes, um, but you can see the website on our um, screen there, vitamin C twenty nineteen dot And there's also a number for our nurses. If you have any questions about breast cancer or your breast health, please do call our nurses on O eight hundred BC Nurse during office hours. We would love to talk with you. Okay, that's it for tonight. Thank you very much and we hope to see you next time. Good night.